Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. At the beginning of Mark's Gospel, way back in chapter 1, the Gospel starts out with these words from the prophet Isaiah. See, I am sending you, my messenger, ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight his path. Familiar? Isaiah, the prophet, the bearer of God's word to the people of Israel. Here are messages, God's messages that he lifts up throughout this whole writing in Isaiah's 66 books of scripture. Isaiah writes in, in a nutshell three ways he uh, speaks to God's people. The first, he says, is this. Because of your unfaithfulness, you will be exiled to another land, servants to another king. And all God's people said, yay. <laughs> Not so much. Then he writes, while they are in exile, while you are here, don't forget God's faithfulness, for God will deliver you. Well, that's a little bit more worthy of a yay kind of response. And then he goes on in the third major portion of Isaiah to say, Remember whose you are. In the midst of suffering, God will reveal God's love and grace and power and presence through you. Well, that's a little intimidating, but a little bit more palatable, perhaps. All these messages from Isaiah preparing the way, and these warnings and remembrances and everything are messages from God that are sometimes we feel and receive them as unwelcome. And yet, at the same one time, on one hand, being unwelcome, on the other hand, they are, with, they are witnesses. They're signs from God, they're words to give hope of God's relentless love always being with us. And it's also these messages from God that the prophet speaks that lead us through life and death and new life. We call it resurrection, where God's love brings a new reality. So let those words from Isaiah simmer just a little bit this morning as we move through our gospel and reflection on our gospel this morning. We heard the question once, and I'll speak it again. Who do people say that I am from Jesus? Who do people say that Jesus is? Who do people say that Jesus is? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. We've heard this. There were some props in our gospel this morning, right? Who do people say that Jesus is? Elijah. Another prompt from our gospel. Who do people say that Jesus is? Messiah. A prophet, the Messiah. Who do people say that Jesus is? A teacher. A fisherman. Fisherman. Carpenter. Carpenter. Healer. All these things are true. All these things are good. And the disciples, kind of like us a little bit, they kind of hem haw around guessing for the right or the best answer. They say John the Baptist, Elijah, the prophets. No doubt these were faithful people who pointed to God and God's works and God's teaching, even God's correction and God's hope. But we quickly discover that it seems everyone has an opinion of who Jesus is. If you ask around, if you were in your circle of friends this week and asked, who do you think Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? You might find some interesting responses like we all do. But from scripture verses to personal and communal experiences, for some lessons from Sunday school come to mind, for others the God of Google would certainly provide you some answers of who this Jesus is. And we know that people say all kinds of things about Jesus to describe, to explain, to complain, or some vague ideas. Given whatever circumstances, people come up with some inkling of who Jesus is. But perhaps one of the best resources for people to help ponder some identity of Jesus is our own scripture, the Bible. 
And up to this point, the middle section, right smack in the middle of Mark's Gospel in chapter 8, up to the, through the first seven chapters, and through up to chapter 8, who is Jesus? Could be answered in these ways. Jesus calls people to pay attention to the here and now that the kingdom of God is near. Jesus calls people to follow. Jesus casts out demons. Jesus heals and teaches and forgives. Jesus raises a little girl from death. A resurrection story, perhaps the first indication of what Jesus' own identity will be. Jesus feeds many. And last week, for those who are here or recall, Jesus goes to the Gentile communities, these non-God-centered people. And through at least Mark's lens of reading and writing, Jesus discovers that those people get who Jesus is, that he's the Lord, and that they are God's people also. And then at the end of last week's Gospel reading, Jesus opened the ears and freed the tongue of the deaf and mute person. And at that place, in that location of which we understand the Holy Land and the Holy People, people are being set apart by the hearing and the freeing of their tongues, hearing and speaking that who God is to be. All of that leading right up to today and immediately preceding today's gospel at the beginning of chapter 8. There are questions about his own identity, Jesus' own identity. And Jesus, right before he speaks again, feeds the people. And he responds this way, I am one who has compassion for the crowd. Before, because they have been with me now for three days and have had nothing to eat, feeding 4,000 people with bread and fish he went on to do. And after the feeding, after their reflection on what just happened, they start to complain that they're hungry. <laughs> and Jesus says this, he starts to question them, prompting perhaps a response. He questions them, asking these questions. Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not perceive and understand who I am? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? And do you not remember when I broke all that bread and made all that fish that you weren't hungry anymore? Do you remember all of that? And then on the tail of that line of questioning, perhaps a figurative exclamation mark in Mark's story, Jesus heals a blind man so that he can see clearly. At first a little fuzzy, but he sees clearly. And at least from Mark's Gospel thus far, the disciples should also have a pretty clear understanding of who Jesus is. Yet their thoughts still remain a bit vague and unclear. But with the pointed wisdom of a teacher, Jesus turns to the teacher's pet. One might say of Peter, like, think Hermione Granger of the Harry Potter series. Wait, who oh, raising your hand? and asks, who do you say that I am? And Peter makes the move from, who do people say that I am, to who do you say that I am? And perhaps we might interrupt this story in Scripture and ponder ways you and I have been and are our being prepared to answer this question. Perhaps some of us have gone through confirmation or are going through confirmation right now that was an, is an intentional way to not only remember the promises in general of God through baptism, or we're given promises of new life, salvation, and forgiveness of sin, but confirmation is this way of firming up with others an orientation to God's activity and discover or rediscover some language of who God is and who Jesus is for the world and for each of us. One way might have been through 
Sunday school so on confirmation. Other ways that we have grown and perhaps have grown in some understanding of who Jesus is is through some kind of faith formation or ways or practices that guide us and grow us to new places in our faith. Perhaps that's through singing and music. Perhaps it's through praying and serving and feeding or protesting and advocating or fasting or walking prayer labyrinths and many more ways in which you have found ways in which you've grown to understand who this God is. Some might simply rely on the knowledge from Sunday school classes, Bible studies, or some who went to seminary or further education, where we memorized and our faith and understanding are made accessible through education. All of those are ways to be formed. So when Jesus asks Peter the question, who do you say I am Peter. I'm deeply convicted that Peter has something there that's worth saying, and he says it really quickly. But it causes me to think, who do I say Jesus is? And I'm deeply convicted in my response that God is love. If anyone were to ask me, who do you say Jesus is, Pastor Mark? I say, God is love. Where did I learn that? Jesus loves me, this I know. Make it go on and on and on. Praise him, praise him, all you little children, God is above. Oh, wow. Praise him, praise him, all you little children, God is above. God is above. Yes. So, God, for me, is love. And what does love look like sometimes becomes the question. And it's not just a mushy, feely kind of love, more than a romantic or charismatic kind of love, but a love that frees me from my own self-destruction, a love that frees me to serve and care for others, a love that even corrects me when I'm wrong. I know shocking news sometimes you wrong sometimes. A love that heals, a love that goes to no ends to serve not only me, but everyone else in the world. A love that goes to the cross, that dies and forgives and saves us all, and me gives me new life. That's who I say Jesus is, and would say that again and again. But maybe the question isn't just for me. The question is for each of us. The question is for you. Who do you say Jesus is? When Peter makes this move from people to you, perhaps he's asking Peter to remember his own people's faith story or their journey of faith from Isaiah that we heard about in the beginning, where Isaiah in the first section talks about their unfaithfulness and being exiled to another land and being servants to one another that feels very oppressive. Peter might begin to remember or think of this, that God's love trains and disciplines people like a parent to a child. And in the second part of Isaiah, when Isaiah explains that God is with us, and don't forget about God being with you in these very difficult times, that God is faithful and that God will deliver you, maybe uh, Peter is remembering through Isaiah, that God will bring us through God's love into a new future and give us hope. And if Peter might be remembering the third part of Isaiah, the third full section of Isaiah, where Isaiah is saying, remember whose you are in the midst of your suffering. For God will reveal God's love and grace and power and presence through you. God is loving these people so much to remind them of their identity, where they are chosen and claimed and loved. Peter might be remembering those ways, at least I like to think of Peter in my response being a little aligned together, that God is about love, and God and Jesus Christ is love. So in responding to Jesus, Peter relies on all of his upbringing and faith in the synagogue and the temple 
preparation for his bar mitzvah. He remembers the faith practices which shape and give meaning to life. And he remembers the teachings, perhaps, of Isaiah, as we've talked, as I talked about, that he's been a recipient of, as also as a witness to God's love. And there's a sense, at least for a moment, if you don't read the next sentence, that Peter gets it right when he sets aside what other people say and says for himself, Jesus, you are the Messiah. And I wish the gospel would just end there for the day, right? Because Peter gets something right. And he speaks from his own heart of hearts. And his fullest, aware, uh, fullest awareness of who Jesus is, and it's his own words of discovery and truth about who Jesus is, that he sets aside what other people say and says for himself, you're the Messiah. Yet, because the Bible, the scripture reading goes on, yet Peter's understanding of Messiah is incomplete. The concept of the Messiah was that this would be one who would come to save the people by power and military action and economic development and leadership and by force. And in a sense, Jesus says, almost, Peter, but not quite. You have the best faithful word to describe me, but you don't yet have the best understanding of what it means to be Messiah. You really don't understand me at all. And at a moment when what others say cannot substitute for what you say, we hear Jesus opening the ears and freeing the tongues to remember. Remember fully and perceive fully and speak the truth of the Messiah of God, who unlike the cultural understanding of the militaristic kind of Jesus, a militaristic understanding of Messiah of his day, the Messiah who Jesus will show them to be will be one who will serve rather than conquer, who will give rather than take, who will love rather than hold anything back. And then to top off who Messiah will be, Jesus explains, that this will be one who will go un undergo great suffering and die and be raised. And it's this kind of Messiah with which Peter begins to take issue. Jesus lovingly asserts that to begin to understand the Messiah of God is to lose one's life, to take up your cross, your suffering, and follow, and do not be afraid. And it's in this that Jesus' question is not only for Peter of olden days and of Scripture, but for each of us today. Who do you say that Jesus is? Today Jesus invites you and me to ponder our responses and not to overlook or forget that Jesus' great love, through his own suffering and death on the cross and resurrection, is not something to be ashamed of but that which opens our ears and frees our tongues to boldly speak, sing, pray, maybe through a simple act of showing Jesus' love in real ways. Amen.